that uh, you guys are providing. And uh, of course, I'm sure we can do special prices on our satellites as well, if uh, <laughs> anybody is, <laughs> just to, to keep the flavor going. So um, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Tony Holt, and I'm going to embarrass him. Uh, <laughs> Because um, it, you know, SSTL is very much a sort of a family uh, uh, enterprise, uh, and Tony perhaps uh, really is a very good example of this. Because it was Tony's father, who was one of the very first people I went to see uh, when we were starting USAT One, to try to persuade to get some uh, support when he was, I think, then uh, managing director of uh, British Aerospace in in Stevenage. Uh, and I went along as a, uh, a PhD student and said, uh, could we scrounge some uh, test facilities, some components, some advice, and so forth. And so uh, I got to know Tony's father then, so that's way back in uh, around about 1978, 79. Um, actually, after leaving uh, uh, BAE, Tony's father then became uh, uh, chairman of SSTL for quite a while. Uh, and so uh, Tony then joined us to keep the family tradition going. Uh, and, uh, uh, and now, as I say, uh, heading up our technical activities. So with that little bit of introduction and embarrassment, I will uh, <laughs> now hand over to Tony, and uh, yeah, you can't do any reciprocal I stories. Say, it saves me the bother of embarrassing myself, doesn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I, I've been with uh, SSTL now for, I think, a uh, oh. Switch this one Switch off. One off. Hello. Do you want to it That'd be quite good. So I tend to wave my arms around quite a bit. There, I'll try. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Good. So I've been with SSTL now for I think about 11 years. Um, so looking at this and, and, and remembering back when I was a child in <laughs> in 1975 and uh, being overwhelmed by uh, by visits to British Aerospace uh, and then ending up here. It's not been deliberate by any at all. Um, and then looking at the, the family of SSTL, it's been a delight to work for SSTL for, for the last 11 years. And this year, what a year it's been. Um, I'll move it on. I'll just go through, there's just a few standard slides. Just if, if you, some of you have been here before uh, or haven't been, uh, this is your first time. Uh, we're about 500 staff. We're about five minutes down the road. Um, we also have uh, an optics facility over in Seven Oaks uh, in Kent and also SST US, which is a, a, a group of about 20 or 30 uh, US people in, uh, in Colorado. Um, and they're actually part of the Airbus Defense and Space uh, um, uh, corporate uh, monster and trying to be as much of an irritant as possible. Um, we have a complete capability, uh, so mission definition, through all the way through manufacture operations, training programs, and, and dealing with uh, various launch vehicles around the world, um, and uh, at low cost and, and high value. But that's, uh, uh, we'll come on to how that uh, turns up. The, uh, this slide's quite nice. It's this year, we've launched another five satellites. Um, so that bumps us up from 43 to 48 satellites launched in the 30 years. We've still got some 15 in manufacture. Um, and export, I think, is one of the key things about SSTL, is that 98% of our business is export. But that's the normal front-end stuff, and now some nice pictures, and what have we been doing this year? I say it's possibly, possibly the busiest year to date. Certainly in my 11 years, I think it's been the busiest, uh, and I've, I have to ask Martin if it's been busier than the years before, but I think so. Um, so I'm going to start just just, uh, just over a year ago, in June uh, and then through July, we had the launch of CasioSat 2, um, which is uh, like a rapid eye. It's a, it's a 6.5 meter resolution multispectral imager with additional agility um, based on our 150 platform. But following soon after that, we also launched the technology demonstration satellite TDS-1, which had uh, experiments from around the UK. Um, the yeah, SSTL experiments I've listed here with really uh, significant interest to us with the hollow cathode thruster. So the hollow cathode thruster is usually used as a neutralizer in electric propulsion. We used it directly as a thruster and actually had to exercise it rather hurriedly to avoid uh, some a collision maneuver. We had a conjunction soon after launch and had to quickly commission our propulsion system and use the hollow cathode thruster. So it, uh, it, it soon it saw aggressive service straight away. Another interesting uh, payload on this was the GPS reflectometry. So the, 
rather odd looking antenna at the front. Um, so that's actually taking the reflections from the GPS signals off the oceans and determining sea state. And so we're currently processing that data and getting sea winds and surface, uh, surface roughness and also detecting ice, ice and sea. So it's been very useful over the poles. Um, we've also got an altimeter on and an inspection camera which has the video of us almost straight after launch. If you pop onto the website, I haven't got it here, um, it shows a video of uh, the satellite rotating in Tumble. Um, the Earth sweeps past and then the Soyuz uh, upper stage uh, behind it. So that's quite a nice little video. And another thing that we did, which I'll come back to at the end, is uh, we started another technology satellite, CBNT-1. You may have seen it on the manifest. There will be hopefully a CPNT 2, 3, and 4. Um, and that's a series of satellites we'll be putting up over the next few years. Uh, <coughs> some of the innovation uh, activities that have been going on, there's very much the can-do attitude in SSTL. Um, and one of our missions, Constellation of Six Satellites, it required uh, a two-axis, it's a, in, in an odd orbit, it's in an inclined orbit, uh, non-sun synchronous. So you get beta angles varying through the year. <laughs> and for the power, we needed a two-axis solar array drive mechanism, power and transfer uh, mechanism. And there was only one supplier in the world, in the US. And they, they, were, they were rather expensive and certainly above what we'd intended. Um, so we decided just to develop it ourselves. <coughs> and so the me mechanisms team did so. So now the only two-axis solar array drive mechanism in, uh, in certainly in Europe or the rest of the world other than America. Um, at a much more aggressive price. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, that SSTL thrives on, I think, is, uh, is really developing where, uh, where we can't buy or, uh, or find the equipment elsewhere. And then, of course, in August, um, we had the major step for SSTL and Europe in the launch of the FM1 and 2 Galileo satellites. So you see the image of the artist's impression of the satellites on the left there. And uh, on the right here is the uh, payload under test uh, or under integration SSTL. So at the back, here you've got the clock, uh, passive hydrogen maser clock. Um, you've got the repeater and then the antenna uh, bays beyond. Um, those were launched on the Soyuz. And as you may well know, the Soyuz upper stage didn't work quite well enough and put us in, a, in the incorrect orbit. This was actually corrected to a 20-day repeat, which um, the nominal would be a 10-day repeat. So they do synchronize with the, GP the rest of the GPS constellations as they go up, sorry, the Galileo constellation as they go up. So they are now um, certainly very useful, and we've commissioned the payloads, and they're operating very well, and there's a bit more on that later. So that was uh, August uh, last year. And then moving into September, and this is where it started to get a little bit, a little bit heated. We, uh, I say the battle for environmental test begins. I think we had, we had 13 spacecraft all vying for environmental test. And of course, the thing is, when, you, when you're building satellites, at, you know, the last stage is, is, is the planning. Uh, it has to remain quite flexible, because you know, as you go through, you have issues. Uh, and we were trying to tighten down on the plans and book all the facilities across, across the UK. And the project team's trying to meet those and the thing's slipping, and it was just uh, hands-on from, from the entire a AIT and the mechanical team. So we filled up RAL, Airbus Portsmouth, Airbus Stevenage, Track, Southampton University, and Interspass Toulouse. We didn't fill Interspass Toulouse, but we, this uh, was GMP, which went down to do its environmental test down in Interspass uh, Christmas. So this started in September, and it was just a mad scramble through to about April. I think we, we finished all environmental tests. But it was a very exciting time. Um, at the same time, one of those craft that we were delivering, this one actually has environmental test out in the US. But our small US uh, office have their first uh, mission, which is an orbital test bed. Um, uh, this is flying various, uh, various payloads, uh, one of which is a deep space atomic clock um, for NASA. Um, being integrated now in, in the US and should be uh, launched next year. So that went out at Christmas. And then in March, um, Carbonite 1, or CBNT 1, sits underneath uh, DMC 3 on PSLV. And uh, we had to come up in a period of about four months a mechanism which would, rather than the usual separation, straight off the axis of, the, uh, of, of your mounting plane, um, we had to 
separate and fling it off to the side because otherwise it would go crashing up into the upper deck. Um, because this program only kicked off in July, of course, we were doing quick feasibility. And then we got to the point where we had to develop this with uh, Antrix. They thought we were mad. Um, this is a test. We're hanging the satellite from, from the ceiling of AIT about 10 meters. Launch axis That's is this way. Thing to do with your phone. DMC3 is up here with the upper deck, so it has to go off. Quite safe. So yeah. This is a test just before we boxed up. That mechanism was developed and qualified in four months. <laughs> Antrix, when we first went to the. You cut that, Brian. Yeah, we'd love to work with you on that. It'll take about a year, a year and a half. And we said, no, we, we, we're going on the launch, which was actually at that time in, in March, the DMC3 launch. And they said, no, you can't, you're mad. So no, look, we've got a great idea. And sent them a drawing, uh, and it went from there, which is great, fantastic. And actually enabled that, enabled that mission. If we, could, if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have flown. Uh, we couldn't have flown. So then in, in March also, we delivered two more Galileo spacecraft into, into orbit. So at the bottom here, you see that's the, the payload uh, box, if you like, being boxed up. So on the top, there's the search and rescue antenna. Behind there should be uh, a, nav a navigation antenna, the phased array antenna, which got um, integrated over in OHB. Um, and then you've got the rest of the bay here, so you've got a repeater on one side, and then the clock panel uh, at the end, which has got to be kept very cold. So this now, uh, we're at a stage where by March we've delivered um, all the fir first 14, uh, what we call work order two, uh, work order one, sorry, and we're into work order two, which takes us up to 22. And, and at, th at the time, we were um, building one payload in three weeks, uh, one week of, of functional test, and then four weeks in environmental test. So we were cycling through. So we're now, uh, the 22nd is now being put together. Obviously, we've got them staggered in various phases. I think we've delivered number 16 now, um, soon to deliver 17. So that's going very well, and uh, quite a step for SSTL, really. Uh, a huge, huge uh, step. Uh, of course, by May, hard work. It's just hard graft. This is the fullest, fullest we've ever seen. SSD. I mean, actually, coming, I don't know if any of you went to the BA facility on the university, but it's no bigger than, well, it's actually smaller than this room, uh, perhaps three quarters the size of this room. And then moving into this hall, and we thought, this is amazing. It was huge. And then come to uh, last year, this, this year, absolutely crammed full. We've not only got this bit full, there's a stores area <laughs> under this gentleman here, which we commandeered to convert into another clean room for the former Sat-7 constellation of six craft. So it squished him down into an even smaller area. Sorry about that, Phil. Um, and then actually underneath me <laughs> in this picture is the Galileo secure area, uh, which has all the Galileo craft in. One of them is actually out in the prep area in the corner there. Um, but you've got the three DMC-3 craft here in their bays. Number four DMC-3 craft at the back. We built a fourth one while we were building three. We thought we might as well build four. Um, Carbonite, CBMT-1, CAS, uh, STSAT, LSAT, um, former SAT-7 with an array deployment rig. Uh, it's got a, a deployed articulated array uh, with that uh, drive mechanism. So we were absolutely rammed full. And the logistics, it's fine when it's like this. But when you go, right, I need to get this craft out to test. So I need to get a whopping great box in from there all the way up here. And it just starts. And by the way, the Galileo craft is coming out here because it's got to go out the door. And this craft's got to go into the thermal chamber at the end. And Steve's there pulling his hair out going, I can't cope. <laughs> so it's really tough. But results is what it's all about. So in June, we got the first Galileo only position fix using combination of IOV and FOC satellites. So you can see here tracking the three, three satellites there. You've got the, uh, the, the position fix down to less than one meter uh, there. And there's some antenna information over in the far side. That is, that is a, a, a screenshot from the control center over in uh, uh, Redoute. So it's all about results, as you guys really do know. And also, there are some difficult times as well. So in June, there are always last minute hitches. So what you're looking at here is, is the DMC-3 craft on its side. Um, telescope starts about here. The light goes down to a primary mirror right at the bottom. It comes back up 
to a, a, a split prism, which has a, a gap between it, which you, you can barely fit a, a molecule in, uh, which then reflects the light across. It comes down through a relay lens and then back across into this focal plane assembly here. Sorry. <laughs> That's typical me. Um, there we go. Uh, and in that is a set of, uh, of, of time delay integration CCDs, a whole bank of them. Uh, and we had, to, we had a little bit of an issue, which meant we had to get those things off in a very clean environment, do a fix, put them all back on on all three craft. Um, and you just have to say that's when it's people that count. It's people, it's not technology. And a small team of dedicated people can do wonders. And it was not long before launch. So last minute issues, uh, you always have to deal with them. And it's the professionalism of the team and dedication of the people, I think, that, uh, that makes it a great place to be. And then, so in June, we shipped eight spacecraft in 36 hours, um, which was busy, and we waved them off. And then the next day, the, uh, the head of Airbus visited, <coughs> and we had an empty clean room. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, look, you really should have come here the day before. <laughs> and of course, the jokes went round. Oh, yes, OK, you know, <laughs> we were busy, really busy, honest. So we um, actually managed to gather uh, we, was, we still had some, uh, we obviously had our Galileo craft, we had Novasar, which I don't have a picture of. I know Martin has on one of his presentations, wherever he's gone, if he's, he's disappeared, he's gone out. Um, so I should have put that on as well. Um, but we actually managed, we, we put, spread out again. Uh, we had a full clean room again. All these craft coming out of the, uh, coming out of the kind of cupboards, you know, <laughs> that we had them stored in. So it was still, uh, when I took him round, it was still very impressive. And what was nice was pointing him to a small uh, avionics that were building, or the electrical system, an electrical platform, I like to call it, um, for the, the Russian company, Vinyem, which is a, a stack of our old original um, microsatellite stacks that go back way a long time to the, to the left of us and turned around and we had Quantum, which is our GMP, which is a 3.5 ton vehicle next to us. And it just showed us where how, how far we've come in 30 years from, you know, small sets. And we're still, of course, d um, uh, delivering CubeSats with CubeSail was on the launch with DMC3. So it was, uh, it was impressive, actually. So once we shipped, of course, we get a team out in India, in Sri Harakota, very hot, um, unpacked and all stood up in line waiting to be tested. So when you get out, they obviously we've got to get everything unpacked and then go through some functional checks and then load the propellant and, and, and do the uh, do all the launch checks before they get integrated onto the launch vehicle. This is a nice picture. So um, I'll try not to unplug myself again. So here is where the three craft sit on the top and they're all angled out slightly so when they, they separate there's uh, no chance of any kind of collision. Um, and at the bottom here You've got CBNT1, of course. That's the deck we've got to try and avoid crashing into while we flip it off to the side. And on the other side is QCell. Um, and then avionics equipment. This is all the avionics bay and propulsion tanks for the upper stage. Um, and then it gets closed up. And it's actually one of the few times I've seen the MC3 without something, a, a cap over the top. <laughs> so it's actually in, in its full flight trim. So that was our last view. Uh, and then a wonderful launch. It was an amazing launch, actually, uh, and the Indian team were outstanding. It was absolutely perfect. Uh, and they were outstanding all the way through in, the, in our integration. They were very supportive, uh, a really, really great team. And then our new ops room. So I guess when you do go over on your tour, hopefully you'll see our new ops room, which is a little bit of a far cry from the old ops room that we had. So we've tarted it up a bit. What's nice here, though, is that we've got, so we are now operating on three antennas. We've got one, uh, the old one on BA over at the university. There's an antenna, an SNX band antenna down in Borden next to our carbon composite facility. And we've also got uh, an arrangement with the KSAT up in Svalbard, um, our polar bear antenna. Um, and that means we get uh, visibility on just about every pass, which is, which is fantastic. So on the bottom, here you can actually see four carriers uh, appearing. I think that's the first time we've had four carriers. That's the three DMC3s and CBNT1 all appearing, and uh, three we had three teams operating and switching between between them. 
that was that was very exciting uh, operations. So the, and just really then the DMC3 is this a high res EO constellation. So it's a constellation of uh, uh, one meter imaging and it's, it's one meter GSD. Um, but the quality is, is, is phenomenal. It's because uh, the MTF is, 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 is very high. So we've also can't CBNT um, can generate images uh, at, at that kind of resolution, but it's it, in terms of its GSD, but in terms of its uh, optical performance, of course, is much different. So this then uh, gives us gives daily access, um, and we have an imaging leasing to a Chinese commercial data company, 21AT. So there are satellites, and uh, we sell the images across to 21AT. So we're looking forward as we go through commissioning now, which is going very well. And then just coming to the end, so in July we also, the day before the launch, signed the Quantum, which is a long time coming. I think on the roadmap, if we look at Martin's roadmap for SSTL, we've just been doing the next 30 years, uh, and I think it was probably 15 years ago, a geo mini satellite platform was on the roadmap. And 15 years later, we finally got one. <laughs> so it's a big step, really, because uh, to break into the telecoms commercial market is, is, is damn hard work. It's a cutthroat business, and they're very demanding. And actually, to sign with, with Utilsat is not quite what we expected. Uh, to be have such a prestige customer for our first, for our first satellite. We're working with uh, the Airbus team on the payload. So it's got a really advanced payload. It's a... Uh, on the top, you can see a, a direct radiating antenna. Um, and then there's a feed array to a, to a reflector. It's, um, it's a highly flexible payload, five kilowatts, just over five kilowatts. So it's KU band, down converts to C band, and then channelizes and switches. So you get anything from 54 megahertz up to 250 megahertz of channel. Um, that's flexibly switched up, up uh, converted again to KU and transmitted down um, beams, which can themselves be steered uh, flexibly because um, both the receive antenna and the transmit have beam forming networks so you can place them where you want to. So it's a highly advanced, uh, highly advanced payload. It's not digitally processed um, but all nonetheless highly advanced. And then looking forward, uh, obviously more telecoms work um, but some of the things we've got, our launches next year, we've got LSAT 1B, uh, which is for the Algerians, um, another satellite for, for Kazakhstan, STSAT. We've got the former SAT 7 Cosmic 2 constellation. I'll come on to that for my last slide. And for, in terms of opportunities, um, I didn't put a picture up of Novasar. Novasar will be launching uh, hopefully next year. That's a, an, an S band SAR um, developed. Uh, a very low cost SAR with support from the UK Space Agency was developed with Airbus in Portsmouth who do the payload, uh, joined our team and that has actually led us on to a signature with Earthcast on their plan so uh, we're, the, we're the builder for their constellation of 16 satellites optical and dual band SAR, so an L band and X band SAR constellation which will be the first of its kind um, so we hope those plans come together. Obviously, it's commercial, so they're raising the, raising the funding for that. Um, and here you can see that's their imager. If you go to Earthcast website, they've got an imager, a video camera on the space station. So that's quite exciting. That's uh, getting into constellations. Um, not the thousands, but uh, a few tens will do. Thousands is going to hurt too much, really, I think. <laughs> and then finally, Formosat 7. This was... Uh, uh, this, this is due for launch in 2016 and a, and a fantastic mission. Uh, six LEO platforms, pretty high power, um, 300 kil kilogram satellites for getting. So all these satellites now, the, this one and the, the DMC-3, DMC-3 satellite was 450 kilograms, so we're getting quite heavy. Carbonite, of course, was under 100, so uh, we're still uh, working down at the lower end. Um, but this is looking at uh, this satellite. The payloads are from the US. Um, from NOAA and the US Air Force, working with a Taiwanese company called NSPO. Uh, and it looks at the GPS signals as they are occulted through the atmosphere. And you can do atmospheric physics and uh, weather, weather pattern predictions from, from the results. 
And so we're looking forward to those being launched uh, at the end of next year. It should be great on a Falcon. So that'll be fun. So that's a year at SSTL. Uh, yes. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Oh, Twinkle, yes. Uh, we're, yeah. Twinkle is, an is, a, is a planet planetary uh, observation mission, if you like. Um, UCL are pushing that hard. Yes, it's, in, it's still in its, uh, in its phase of trying to get traction, and we're helping UCL with that. Is this project on Metro Falcon 17? Yeah, that would, that's the plan. Um, it's, it's, but we need to get it to a point where it's a fully funded program. Um, right. We're pushing for that. Uh, I hope there'll be some news on that maybe this year. There, there would need to be to hit that launch date. Uh, otherwise, of course, it'll slip. As with science missions, these things tend to happen. But yes, yeah, so we're, we're excited about that uh, uh, UCL program. They've they pushed it. It's um, it's on a 300 SSTL 300 satellite, so it's uh, probably in the order of two or three hundred kilograms. Um, but a very si exciting mission. Any other questions? One right at the back. Yes. 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 Oh. <laughs> is, is he in the room? <laughs> Awfully mundane, actually. <laughs> and, and that, that's a direct feed to us. So we were in the in the ops uh, operations room uh, with the video running, uh, and he was giving us a, just a commentary on 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 as the launch vehicle uh, going up and what was happening with the stages. And uh, I think there are a few comments, uh, uh, a few comments about perhaps uh, the, the scorch marks on, on, on the pad, and a few, a few quick, uh, <laughs> quick, <laughs> a few jokes in between the, the, the um, firing of the third and fourth stage. But uh, it was very, very tense, so he wasn't making too many jokes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, what opportunities do you see with the Chinese space program? Um, they recently advertised um, for. Commercial partners, for example, to go to the moon. Yeah, I, I think um, over the next f uh, several years, the uh, collaboration with China will, will, will increase. Um, we've now been working with the uh, 2180 for the last, I think, the launch in it was in 2005. So it's it's ten it's ten years we've been working with with them, um, and also we're looking at some of the uh, the Chinese technologies for util utilization on, on in our systems. So I think um, it's, uh, it's politically interesting, uh, but I think the, the, the walls are coming down quite rapidly. Um, and I think with the commercial entities, that's the key, is to, is to move into the, into the commercial, commercial world, um, and then the collaboration will, will, uh, will grow more quickly. We don't have any missions right now. Um, we were looking um, with the Beijing Institute for some science missions. Um, there's one possibility, um, and they're uh, visiting, I think, in, in September. Um, nothing else just at the moment commercially. We are, we are in discussions with various uh, entities, commercial entities there, but um, nothing specific. But I think it's the commercial, it's, it's watching the commercial framework in, in, in China grow and then how we engage with the commercial framework. Anything else? Oh, I better stop now. Be wind up. One more question then. Are you still looking at uh, docking rockets? Technologies that allow yeah. you to dock Yes, yes. Yeah. We've, we've just put in a proposal. So there's the arrest mission, uh, which is between university and, uh, uh, and Caltech, where they're looking at forming a mirror in space rather than launching a big mirror, um, which is hard, is, uh, is dock smaller mirror elements uh, and then you can reconfigure it as well. So they've, they've been studying that system. <coughs> we would like to fly that as a technology demonstrator in the next few years. Um, so we're looking at the funding lines and the commercial opportunities for that. But certainly with the CubeSats and NanoSats uh, in, in the 5 to 50 kilogram range, the kind of constellation uh, swarming, Docking, uh, building infrastructures in space is something we're, we're, we're looking at quite seriously. So there's various methods uh, which, which we will be under investigation over the next five years, <coughs> certainly on our roadmap. Okay. okay.